Pixels from a Crime Scene, Episode 4. It's not all on the dark web. Due to the themes covered, this podcast is suitable only for adult audiences and not suitable for children. There is information at the end of this podcast about where you can go to get help. I'm Angela Young, and this is episode four of Pixels from a Crime Scene, a podcast series looking at what's being done to get child sexual abuse material off the internet. It's been commissioned by the Internet Watch Foundation about its work and the work of its partners. Less than half a percent of all the known explicit sexual web pages of children on the internet are hosted in the UK. And in this episode, we'll look at the truly global nature of the problem on a journey from America via India to the Democratic Republic of Congo. There is a push for, you know, digital India. There is a push for access to the internet. And with that, we do see that this could be potentially a problem. We also have to understand that we're a country where a lot of people are using cell phones. So while hotlines can resolve, uh, you know, issues on the public internet, what happens when these images are uh, sort of, you know, shared using OTT devices or this peer-to-peer sharing that we talk about. So that is really uh, an emerging challenge for India. It's a relatively poor country, and we don't have the technology to um, to deal with those issues. And that makes the, the job very, very hard. But um, uh, we've uh, put, a, uh, put up a device, or developed a device, whereby whenever we see an image of a child and then we see adults around those children, we try to capture those images of the adults and 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 uh, broadcast them on TV, asking people if they can identify those people. The myth we're setting out to bust in this episode is that it's all on the dark web. In 2019, the UK's National Crime Agency described how they believed there are 144,000 individuals from the UK on some of the worst child sexual exploitation and abuse sites on the dark web. We're going to try to understand more about what's on the dark web compared to what's found on the open web and what the challenges are. The majority by number of images, I'm sure, will be on the open web uh, and we are working hard to challenge that. And and because there is a link between the dark web and the open web, I think it would be very rare to find somebody whose first experience is on the dark web. I think most people start their journey, offending journey, on the open web and progress through to the dark web. That's Rob Jones from the National Crime Agency. So it's not all on the dark web. Now, I'm assuming most of us don't know a lot about it or how you access it. Someone who does know is author and broadcaster Jamie Bartlett. His investigative podcast, The Missing Crypto Queen, about a cryptocurrency called OneCoin, means he sometimes needs to hide his IP address so people don't know where he's operating from. And you can find the series on BBC Sounds. I went to meet him. I'm here at Jamie Bartlett's house in London. He's promised to show me some of the secrets of the dark web. But first, I want him to explain what the dark web is. Hi, Angela. Hello. Come on in. Thanks very much. (laughs) Jamie, I'd really like to know first, for people like me who don't know what the dark web is, Can you explain? It's a small network of maybe five or 10,000 sites that are sort of on a hidden bit of the net that you access with a special browser called the Tor browser, which is very uh, secure. It's a sort of secure privacy enhanced browser. When you use it, people don't know where where you are in the world and they can't monitor your traffic and stuff like that. And you use that to get onto this network. It's a small network, but it's, if it's five or 10,000 sites, they're sites that are very hard to find for the authorities because 
they use this special protocol, which means the server on which they're based is obscured. They use very clever encryption to do that. So what you're really talking about here is a network of five to 10,000 sites that are very, very sort of hidden and secretive, hard to locate, so hard to censor or remove from the internet, visited by people using a very secure sort of anonymous web browser. And so it's become this strange place where anyone who has a reason to stay hidden finds quite a natural home there. So the implication is that anybody using it has got something to hide, perhaps illegal purposes. Yeah, but people have good things to hide as well, don't they? I and mean, there's reasons why people legitimately want to stay hidden or private. So the Tor browser, the thing you use to get onto the darknet, was originally a US naval research project because they wanted to be able to go on the internet without giving away their IP address or their web traffic. And I used the Tor browser yesterday because I wanted to research a slightly dodgy group and I did not want them to know where I was, where I lived, what my IP address was. So this Tor browser, which was originally a government project, had a little problem in the early days because government were the only people using it and they thought, well, there's no point if we're the only ones using it, everyone will know it's us. So they made it an open source project, got picked up by a foundation. They started, you know, they started developing it and then they sort of used by privacy activists and journalists all around the world. And it's won several awards for the spread of freedom and democracy. So the Tor browser is an amazing tool. It's brilliant. But people obviously do misuse it. So you use it to get onto the dark net. You can use it on the normal internet as well to keep yourself a little bit more secure. But people use it to get onto the dark net. And yes, there's a lot of illegal activity there. But people use it to get onto the dark net because they are journalists that want to speak securely to people, because they are whistleblowers who want to share information with somebody, or because they're activists, you know, trying to operate in a dangerous part of the world and they want to create a forum where they can't be infiltrated easily. So there are so many good reasons for the dark net. It's kind of got a bit of a bad name for obvious reasons. And the, the name itself, the dark net, probably doesn't help. They call it Tor Hidden Service. And then, with a few clicks, Jamie opened the door to a whole world of crime. OK, so if you look at this, this is a normal web browser. And I've gone to the website, whatismyipaddress.com. I'm not going to read the IP address to you, but there it is. And you can see that's roughly where we are, isn't it? There you go, North London. If I put whatismyipaddress.com on my Tor browser, that says that I'm in the Netherlands. So this is the amazing thing, which is brilliant, because if I'm going on to study some dodgy group and they look up my IP address, they'll be chasing shadows. And unfortunately, that's the same reason why criminals sometimes like this. So here's a list of all a series of very popular darknet sites. And you'll see here that they all finish .onion, not .com. And so, if I want to go onto one of these sites with a normal web browser, I won't be able to go onto those sites because it won't recognize it. Like it. But if I use my Tor browser, I can get onto a dot .onion site. Now, I don't want to go to anything too dodgy here, obviously, but this is where you see all of the links for the... I mean, I don't even really want to read it because it's, yeah, it's pretty grim, isn't it? Jamie described the dark web as five or 10,000 websites which are incredibly well hidden. They're set up for many different purposes, not necessarily child sexual abuse material, but they do include this. What makes them challenging is that you can't locate the criminal content which is there in order to remove it. Also, for the people who visit the dark web, their location's obscured, and someone might want to do this for many good reasons, not just to hide illegal activity. The IWF, by contrast, operates on the open web, where there are over a billion websites and where they find millions of child sexual abuse images and videos each year. In 2019, these were hosted across 4,956 websites. The problem is very real in both the dark web and the open web, with unique challenges in both. One of the ways in which CSAM is shared on the open web is via encrypted services such as WhatsApp. 
Lucy Proctor knows from awful experience that that is the case. She's a BBC senior producer and the mother of two young children. One day after she dropped them at nursery, she got a message from the WhatsApp group of mums she was a member of. They were usually about school trips, lost uniform, you know, the sort of thing. This time, however, one of the mums had sent a video asking the others what they thought. Lucy clicked on it. It actually took quite a long time before I understood what I was watching. It was so, like, out of my experience. And um, the reason it was difficult to work out what it was is it starts quite innocently. Uh, it's just a man, a white man, and a baby boy, about 18 months old, sitting on a sofa. Just kind of normal looking. The baby obviously knows the man. Um, and then it cuts to this video. And, you know, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. I'm a journalist and so I knew this was a huge problem. I knew young people um, and young children were being abused. I know that it's endemic. I know that it's mostly in families. Um, and I know that that sort of stuff is now filmed and shared. So I wasn't completely naive. Um, some of the women on the group are much more um, naive than me and they really couldn't believe that this even happened. I obviously knew that it did happen. So I wasn't massively shocked that it was happening, but still seeing it, even just seeing a few seconds of this actually happening to a, a child um, was massively shocking, to be honest. Um, you know, and I've seen bad things and I've seen videos of bad things at work, but I wasn't at work when this happened. I was at home. So I was just not prepared for seeing something that disturbing. And it affected me quite a lot personally. I had plans that weekend uh, to go and see a mate and I just had to cancel it. I was so anxious and um, very emotional uh, for a few reasons, really. Um, number one, just actually seeing that was disturbing and I think it would be disturbing for anybody. Also, my child was the same age as this boy in the video at the time and so I think that made it extra disturbing for me. And... Um, I just couldn't stop thinking about it and some of the other mums that were in the group, some of whom are really good friends of mine now, they found exactly the same thing, you know, just for weeks and weeks. We couldn't get this kid out of our heads. We thought about him all the time. We worried about him. I wondered if he, you know, it, was it happening to him right now? Um, and I was actually wondering if he was even still alive. I mean, if you're prepared to do that to a baby, what else are you prepared to do? Lucy has made a programme about her experience, The Boy in the Video, which you can hear on BBC Sounds. One of the advantages of the internet is that it doesn't know national borders, and that is also one of the challenges in the fight against CSAM. The IWF runs a hotline, which is one of 46 around the world, where members of the public can anonymously report child sexual abuse material, or CSAM as it's referred to by those who work in this area. They're part of an international network of hotlines called InHope, based in Amsterdam. I'm going to Schiphol Airport to meet InHope's chief executive, Denton Howard. to the Netherlands, which is a very interesting place in terms of the fight against CSAM, because on one hand, it's the home of the international network of hotlines to report online abuse. But ironically, it is also the country which is one of the main global centres for hosting it. And that is quite a sensitive issue here. I'm meeting Denton Howard, chief executive of InHope, at their headquarters a subway ride away in downtown Amsterdam. I want to know how the network operates. InHope is a network of hotlines. Uh, we currently have 46 hotlines in 41 countries uh, on every continent. Basically, a hotline is a facility where the public can make reports of online child abuse material or alleged online child abuse material that they have come across. So they can anonymously tell the hotline who will in turn investigate to check if it is child abuse material 
um, within the legal definitions. And if it is, then they will take actions. Now, the actions depend on um, where the content is apparently hosted. So obviously, if the content is hosted in the same country where it's reported, they will take, they will have connections with the police and with law enforcement, uh, prosecutorial services, with the internet service providers and government, and take the actions nationally. Uh, where InHub comes in is when the, the content is hosted in a different country. Sadly, it nearly always is, um, by the nature of the internet. It does not recognise borders. So InHub as a network, because we operate what we call a trust system, where hotlines have to become validated and have to go through a variety of different requirements to become members, um, they uh, become trusted so the hotlines can share reports of child sexual abuse material with each other so that the action can be taken. So a co content that's reported in country A that is hosted in country B, so the, we have an infrastructure which we call ICCAM, Okay, which the letters ICCAM stand for IC Child Abuse Material, a very unusual name, I'm sorry. Um, so that allows that information to be exchanged with uh, the hotline in country B. In turn, they can take action on the content that is hosted in that country. You're currently working to expand in Asia. Um, that's uh, areas where we imagine a lot of this material is hosted or perhaps even produced. Have you met any resistance there? There are certain cultural issues which do get in the way, but it's generally as we engage and get to know people and just build relationships, and we try and introduce people in, in a new country, we try and introduce them to individuals they may know in a country where we have a presence uh, at various different events. And so once they gain a level of comfort or a certain level of experience and they go, oh, it works well in your country, well, then I'm okay with that. And so we, we do have to work with that. Um, now, I will just focus on one of the key areas for us is we've, we've, we've regionalized InHope. So we are currently, uh, just, just in month, the past month, uh, we started our Latin America uh, region uh, hub in Colombia using our existing member, Te Proteo, um, where we will hub training and support for that region because there's a common language and a common culture. Um, in respect of the Asia-Pacific region, while we have a number of members already in the Asia-Pacific region, specifically Taiwan, South Korea, um, we have Australia, New Zealand, uh, Thailand and Cambodia, um, we are going to expand. So we're starting the process of expansion in the Philippines and we'll be using them as the initial hub for Asia-Pacific. That's Denton Howard from InHope in Amsterdam. One of the problems with the Dutch approach is that getting child sexual abuse material taken down involves the courts. Now, this creates a significant time lag, which other countries don't have. The UK, on the other hand, hosts less than half a percent of the material, thanks to a zero-tolerance approach. Fred Langford is the chief technical officer at the IWF and also the president of InHope. So how has the UK reduced hosting of these images to almost zero? Initially, the UK used to have a much larger percentage of the global hosting. So as that's developed, in uh, particularly in countries like the Netherlands, and obviously with the US, and, and as uh, people have come online globally, they've started to develop their own hosting, that has meant that uh, not so much of the global hosting is hosted here. That's, that's just to put it in context, but actually really I would say what it is, is because of the hostile uh, um, environment that we have here in the UK. So the IWF will issue a notice, we will telephone, we time ourselves on how quickly we can get the content removed. Um, we work very close with law enforcement who are very engaged and want to prosecute, which is not the case in all countries. Um, and also the willingness to take this one step further. So that's law enforcement, government, as, as well as the IWF, which, which is if somebody doesn't respond positively to get some content removed, it's treated as a bit like, why would you not remove it? So let's focus our attention. Um, and that, that sort of um, sort of behaviour, focusing the intention on those that aren't necessarily removing it quickly, means that, um, means that everybody realises it's a hostile environment and, the, and word soon spreads um, that IWF and law enforcement collectively work together to get the content removed as quickly as possible. So actually, if you're going to host in the UK, respond very quickly and get the content removed quickly. So it's, it's more of a culture we sort of 
collectively building between industry, IWF, law enforcement and government to say zero tolerance to this content in the UK, let's get it removed. The view of the IWF chief executive Susie Hargreaves is clear. She's urging the Netherlands to follow the UK's lead. Hosting of child sexual abuse content in the UK has been less than 1% for many, many years, and that's because we have a zero tolerance approach to hosting it in the UK. So if you compare that to the Netherlands, which is incredibly high, currently at around 70% of the content we remove, it's because we have a zero tolerance approach. We work closely with the police, with government. We say to people, we won't host this content here, and it's not in the UK but then people host it elsewhere. It sort of moves. Yes, people do say that to us. They say, well, all you've done is move it from the UK to the Netherlands or another country, and you're basically just pushing it around the world. And my response to that is always, well, you know, if every single country in the world did what we did, there'd be nowhere for this to hide. The executive director of the Dutch hotline, Meldpunt Kinderporno, is Arda Gerkens, who's also deputy president of the Dutch Senate. She didn't want to record an interview for the podcast, but she did talk to me on the phone. She admitted that the Netherlands has a problem and struggles to keep up. She said the IT environment in the Netherlands is attractive because connection speeds are very fast, and those trying to get images taken down have to get a court order ruling that the images are illegal, and this slows everything down. The government is bringing forward new legislation to change that. The hotlines in both the US and Canada have been doing some extraordinary work to combat CSAM, and the public has been part of that fight. A hotline set up by the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMEC, has received 58 million reports since 1998, with most of those being received in the past few years. John Sheehan is Vice President of the Exploited Child Division at NECMEC. He says a lot of those reports come from the internet companies themselves as they have mandatory reporting in the US, which means companies have a legal obligation to notify NECMEC if they find any suspected CSAM on their platform. These are the companies that host images and videos on their platform. They're using technology to find, remove and report offenders that put that type of content on their platform. By having those images and videos within the cyber tip line, um, we are authorized by Congress. We can actually share elements of that information back, not just with law enforcement, but also the tech community. We have millions of digital fingerprints. They're, they're referred to as hash values from uh, these crime scene photographs. These images and videos of child sexual abuse were able to derive those digital fingerprints and provide those to the hosting providers anywhere around the world primarily here in the U.S. is what we're working with, but really anywhere in the world, if they want to voluntarily scan their systems to try and identify that content, remove it, and report. Now, that being said, a lot of the work that's being done here at the center, those 58 million reports, 18 million that came in just last last year, a lot of that's regarding the open net. Um, we certainly are trying to work with providers to make sure um, low-level offenders, they can't go to a search engine and find content. They can't go on to a Dropbox or a Facebook, those types of, of providers, those family-friendly environments. You're not going to come across that, that material. But there's a lot more work to be done. The internet is vast, much more than just the open, open net. You're talking about peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, there's internet relay chat. There's the Tor and the dark net, as well as Usenet. There's a lot of areas of the internet that don't fall under what we'll say, quote unquote, open net um, that need attention and, and really law enforcement investigations. The message we're hearing constantly throughout this series is that any solution needs to be global, which is why initiatives like the We Protect Global Alliance to End Child Sexual Exploitation was launched in 2014 to bring together countries, law enforcement, industry and NGOs to fight the problem together and we'll be hearing later from its founder, Baroness Shields. Technical examples of ways to fight the problem include the creation of crawlers to find the content. While the IWF has a series of bespoke crawlers, one of the major global initiatives is Project Arachnid, developed by the Canadian hotline CyberTip Canada. Stephen Sauer is director of CyberTip Canada. So Arachnid is essentially a platform for reducing the availability of child sexual abuse material online. 
And what we've done is we've created this um, platform that um, has aspects of crawling for child sexual abuse material on uh, websites that have been reported to us and, and um, looking for child sexual abuse material on those, as well as crawling areas of the dark web. Um, and, and then we also offer an API for industry members who wish to vet the content that's posted on their services. And they then will uh, utilize the data within Project Arachnid to um, get material removed from that. So it's, it's kind of, it's a larger platform beyond just the crawling piece. We are sending out notices and detecting um, millions upon millions of images. So we've, uh, right now we have approximately um, 10, 10 million suspected images in Project Arachnid that we are, are going through. And we've sent more than 4.7 million notices for, for the removal of child sexual abuse material on the public internet. There is no uh, geographical borders when it comes to Project Arachnid. Um, we, our stance is that we need to get this removed as quickly as possible. And so we send notices directly to providers in Canada, the U.S., um, as well as worldwide. And then in countries where there are other hotlines like ours, a part of an association called InHope, um, we send the information to them for them to reach out to their um, providers in their country to have that content removed. That's Stephen Sauer, Director of Cybertip Canada. We heard from hotlines in the UK, USA and Canada, three of the richest countries in the world, and countries that have resources to fight the problem. But what about other parts of the world? In 2014, the IWF launched its reporting portal programme, which enables countries that can't afford a hotline to establish a local reporting page for their citizens to report suspected child sexual abuse. The page links to the IWF's hotline, where it is assessed and action can be taken as necessary. To date, the IWF has established 32 across the world, including India and the Democratic Republic of Congo. My name is Uma Subramanian, and I am the co-founder and co-director of a civil society initiative called the Arambh India Initiative based in Mumbai. And we work on the issue of protecting children from sexual offences. While we were working on the issue um, and these sort of real life cases started to emerge where we were seeing that children were being filmed and children, uh, their pictures were being taken. One of the questions that remained was what happens to these pictures? Uh, and one of the things that triggered uh, sort of the thought in our minds was also when we encountered a case of a 15 year old boy who was groomed on the internet uh, and he ended up sharing an image of himself. And subsequently he sort of, uh, you know, he was a victim of penetrative sexual assault and went through the most brutal forms of assault was when the perpetrator threatened him that this is going to go on the internet and it's going to go viral. And the child didn't know what to do and the child ended up, you know, in this situation. So one of the key questions remained as to what happens to these images uh, and where do these images go? And if they're put out on the internet, what mechanism do we have uh, to take it down? The only mechanism was to actually go to the police station. So you go there, you register a formal complaint, um, you also sort of, uh, you know, give them your device, your machines, um, and maybe they will do something about it. I mean, that's the only hope that they'll do something about it to take it off the internet. Uh, and we do realize that there is a lot of stigma around going to the police station itself, even for general things, you know, leave alone issues of sexual violence. Uh, so we realize that there has to be a way where somebody can access a facility which allows them to report anonymously and the image or the video is taken down in a time-bound manner because we realize that in the healing process for victims, this is the first thing that they want to know, that my image is off the internet. My name is uh, Theodore Menelik. I'm the founder of Menelik Education. We came across uh, IWF and we've discussed um, on a lot of issues. And uh, we, we thought that the work that they do in terms of protecting uh, vulnerable children uh, was was in line with uh, or in tune with the work that we were doing. So it made it made it a perfect match. And that's how we became holders of the portal in the, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it gives confidence also to children and, and, uh, and young people that are affected by these things to actually contact uh, anonymously people so that, you know, they, uh, they don't feel retribution 
question because we are a society, well, the Congolese, um, it's a society where people have, have, are a bit vulnerable. So this medium offers them the opportunity to actually um, uh, say something without shame, for one, and second, uh, without people knowing who they are and stuff like that. So it gives them an added protection. We had a child that was abused uh, by uh, a general and the general was living next door to the family. Um, the mother was living abroad. She wanted us to take action against the general. But the father who was living next door did not want us to take action against the general. So those are the issues. And the, the, the father settled with money as opposed to um, uh, doing the right thing in terms of protecting the rights of their of their children. So we have those kind of issues. So when you have, because people are relatively poor, you know, living with uh, $30 uh, dollars a month. Um, so when you offer them a, a lump sum of money, or however, you know, f- uh, for them, it's, it's a way out. So they s- tend to often sacrifice the greater, um, uh, you know, their children for the money. So you have those issues that come into play as well, yes. One of the growing issues uh, that we've seen is this live streaming, where unfortunately people are paying to direct abuse elsewhere. And it, it is a source of money. We've seen it uh, a lot in Asia, in the, the, in the Far East. Um, can you protect against that before it becomes a big issue? Yeah, we have that's a, a very uh, a very serious problem in the Congo. Like I said, it's a it's a relatively poor country, and we don't have the technology to um, to deal with those issues, and that makes the the job very very hard. But um, uh, we've uh, put a, uh, put up a device or develop a device whereby whenever we see an image of a child, and then we see adults around those children, we try to capture those images of the adult and 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 uh, broadcast them on TV asking people if they can identify those people and fr- from that try to trace the people we've been able to trace three people in that sort of fashion but it's it's hard if they're living say for example if it's happening away from the capital city for instance it makes it a bit more difficult because communication um, between the capital and the, the remote areas of the Congo is a, is a bit problematic Two stories there from the front line of the fight against child sexual abuse material from India and the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is our fourth podcast in the series Pixels from a Crime Scene, and you can hear all of them by visiting your usual podcast provider. And remember, if you see child sexual abuse material online, report it to the IWF. If you've been affected by anything you've heard in this podcast and need to know where you can get help, please visit iwf.org.uk forward slash podcast. The IWF is a charity and urgently needs to extend its work. To support them financially, please visit iwf.org.uk forward slash fundraising. In our next podcast, we'll consider whether the internet industry is doing enough to stop these explicit sexual images of children being circulated online. We'll talk to Microsoft, TalkTalk, Google and Facebook about how the tech industry can pull together to protect children. We use a certain kind of video matching technology that is based off of our platform and the way our platform works. Google uses a different type of technology. How do we ensure that those technologies can talk to each other? This technology that we recent, recently released helps to do that, helps to bridge those connections so that as an industry we can really approach this in a cross-industry way. I'm Angela Young and this is a Cambridge podcast production. It's produced by me and Vince Hunt. The music is by Jay Richardson, artwork by Louis Arabia, and sound design and mixing is by Ben Carver. Join me next time.